There's a lot of talk right now that this pandemic could spell the end of the kind of push for urbanization and centralization we've seen in recent years in cities across the country, including here in Phoenix. Welcome to The Sunshine Economy on WLRN. I'm Tom Hudson. Thanks for listening and supporting public radio. The new normal is here today. Florida begins a full phase one reopening after the shutdowns, the slowdowns, and the stay-at-home orders to help slow the spread of COVID-19. Restaurant dining rooms, shopping malls, and hotels can reopen with limitations. It's a calculated effort balancing the need to protect public health and the demand for economic activity. Tens of thousands of people have lost their jobs. The more have lost at least part of their Florida, income. There's a lot Work more to consider has changed. For those who you know, can, their homes the now double as office, office space. Look For others, masks, work face shields, and gloves have become part of their work wardrobe. Social distancing is now the rule for Moreover, everyone. How long and lasting will this new normal be? It may be a balance between infection rates and unemployment rates, between epidemiology and economics. Today on the program, we spoke with two people who research and think a lot about how we live and work, particularly in South Florida how this region has benefited from globalization and the risks that may pose now. Even though Richard Florida shares his surname with the Sunshine State, he's from New Jersey, but he lives and works here part-time now. He's a professor at the University of Toronto and a visiting fellow with FIU's Miami Urban Future Initiative focused on urban planning and economics. Richard, welcome back to WLRN. How is the virus reshaping how we work well, through know, the virus as we live with the virus here in South Florida? Very highly, believe it or not, it's I've weathered the storm right, right here in, in Miami Beach. By the way, um, and the reason the I did that is because I can work remotely. Workers, you know, I'm one of, of more or less a third to 40 percent of Americans who are professionals, who do knowledge work, creative work, whatever you call that who have the great good fortune to work remotely. And uh, being able to work remotely, that means I have not gone to a store. I've had stuff delivered to me in Miami Beach since March 13th. So think about that. I could shelter in place and be safe and sound and get grocery deliveries and food deliveries. And if I needed something from the pharmacy, it came to me. But I think this thing with remote work is going to be a long-term shift. I think companies are going to realize that it's cheaper. You know, they're not to have giant office towers and in that or office sense blocks, that you also suburban point out office that parks that, that, that yeah, you know, people can come in when they need to meet or need to do something. But, but over time, I think you the know, shift to office, remote work which kinds of places for about 40% of, of the workforce is going to be a big deal. And I don't think we'll ever go back to quite as many people working in offices as we had before. There are enormous economic consequences for that, given the local real estate industry and the amount of capital that's been invested in those glass and steel and concrete buildings buildings uh, that have gathered along the waterfront here in South Florida. Nursing homes. And when that you know, in the short term, people are so going to be really scared no of crowded buildings. They're going to be really so scared of elevators. I have not gotten into an elevator with another person, and, and I live in a condominium, and that, that tells me something. I'm not a super risk-averse person. Our homes now, Miami doesn't have quite the issue of New York or Chicago or Toronto or London, where so many people in those towns take a train or transit. But yeah, I think people are going to be scared, obviously Big companies have already said. You know, I'm in urban uh, many of them said really not until fall will they reopen offices. Um, and some are saying already, some of these big high tech companies, um, urbanization. not until 2021. And that's because urbanization So, and you know, can you imagine, you know, I've been a big fan of COVID. Uh, I thought it was a really cool thing, but you know, I, I can't imagine people wanting to go back to a co-working space, you know, what once disease. looked so exciting so to be around the, all these the strangers and mixing and mingling now just looks like a great biohazard. I've been talking to a lot of commercial real estate developers, a big effort, staggered work we'll schedules, staggered days, and we'll come in two days a week, to five years, come in only to meet, stronger. come in Industries at, say, like 7, 7.30, like 8, like 8, 8.30, 8, 30, 9, and then leave at 3, 3.30, 3, 4, 4, 4, 4.30, 4.30, 4.30, 5. No but I think we're going to see buildings with there, temperature there checks. Also no doubt you know, if you go in the door, you look at China, leave they're taking temperatures and, multiple you know, times a, a day. Trend. People are talking Who's about, leaves? you know, giving different Older office floors a health grade, you know, and based on how sanitary it is, if anyone got sick there and so on and so forth. It also argues, Richard, for maybe just less of it, less office space, less class A, class B office space, fewer retail footprints that are needed on the real estate landscape. I think that's all coming. I think all that's coming. I think one is we're going to see less office space be needed. 
as more people At work from home, there time, still will there be office space and they need for meeting back. rooms. Cities may become and two, I mean, I think we you know, already have been seeing the retail apocalypse, and the United States is the most over retail place Seattle, in the Boston, world. And, Washington, DC, you know, Greater Miami has so a lot of retail. I mean, when you think about all the different retail hubs, you know, there are from Bell Harbor to the Design District, Brickell City, and I'm just naming a few, you know. Yeah, Dolphin Mall, Sawgrass Mills, Dayland, yeah. There's so many of these things. No, and I think I think the other thing we talked about online no working, online, online shopping. I mean, I've always been an online shopper, shopper but everyone has become an online shopper. So, you know, if you think back to the economic crisis, might flock back. one of the things that happened so in this place, Miami, downtown Miami, is they built uh, all those condos in Brickell and, and around the, the downtown and innovative places that they couldn't sell. You know, one, one and I remember, I lived here then, but I remember reading articles in the New York Times, young people flocking back to downtown Miami because the condos didn't sell, but they were turned into lower cost rental than you would have had to pay to be in a condo. And so and we got a lot of people who were downtown Miami. To rebuild around I local think that one of the, the silver linings you know, in this, if you consider uh, the silver lining, is all of that office corner, space and retail uh, space can now become housing, and it's going to put shelter, pressure on the housing market. Group. It's not going to make so, affordable so housing for the low-income people. We badly need that. But for the middle class, or the working uh, middle class, or the professionals, the yeah, I think Miami could become more affordable, affordable, affordable in the short run. Housing affordability is one of those economic vulnerabilities that we've known existed here for years and years and years, and has been growing in its severity prior to the virus and the virus Exposed transitional cities like that Phoenix. vulnerability, it exposed yet again the wage gaps that exist rise. here, the transportation constraints, the health care inequities. How does the virus, do you think, uh, affect efforts what will this do for a to city address like ours, those that had been so gaining momentum at a public struck, policy said, side as well as in private industry know, here locally? Scottsdale and we have a choice that we can grow good. better now. I, I swear to My God, own work has been on reopening and recovery. Why, how do we, how do we why, reopen why safely and securely with social safe. and physical distancing, with uh, personal protective equipment, very with health place, and safety checks? And other parts uh, of but moreover, how do we recover? And I think of this, you know, so South Florida pretty much understands this. This is like disaster recovery. First you mobilize. And then you begin to re-prepare and rebuild, and then you, know, you recover. You use the amenities so coming out like of this, we're going to have a three to four to five year recovery, inside, even as we get beyond the virus. Little kids and little Do we want to go back to the unaffordable, highly gentrified, and incredibly unequal kind of society we have now, and one that's exposed to both health risks and climate risks? Or well, do we I want to take Phoenix this opportunity because there's going to be a lot of money flowing to recovery? What may happen? Federal money, state money, private money, out in the capital. Do some we want to take this to really think long and hard? Away. Do we want some a more inclusive and resilient recovery? And, for and I'd hope for the – I'm not, no office centers I'm not saying we're going to get that, but I, I do think there are communities but around the time, country and the world the that are thinking about back. that. Let so, me give you one example. You know, maybe this you is a simple example. The gas as hard as you did. Communities so around I the country and the world are definitely moving to pedestrianized streets and to add bike lanes. Now, I not to say that's a big thing. It's a small thing. But it's one I did not think we'd see. Well, you could do a lot more. You can begin to think about more inclusive development, also uh, more so not just putting temperature so checks ways, at buildings, this but making them more resilient and healthier. Towards so yeah, I think over the next three to four to five years, we're going to choose All right, the way we want to be. Thank and, you so and, much you know, for that's us. really, at oh, the end of the day, so up to us. What are some of those components that you're looking for as kind of milestones to give you a sense of the direction of the recovery? If it's back to the normal or creating this new normal, as others have called it, especially given, Richard, the reliance on service jobs, particularly low-pay, uh, concentrated jobs here in South Florida. I've become a student of great pandemics. I've read so many histories now that I had never read before about the bubonic plague, the black plagues, particularly the 1918 Spanish flu in the United States, where we have great research, uh, and all the pandemics that have come since. And, and I'll tell you, they do not really change us that much. I mean, we forget about these things. Even the 1918 flu, I mean, most of my aunts and uncles were kids during the Spanish flu because my parents were born in the 20s. But most of my aunts and uncles were. They never mentioned it. You know, they talked about the Depression and the war and all of this. I do think the one thing that you mentioned that could be a signal could be how we treat our frontline essential workers. You know, as I mentioned, I've been staying home, being safe, getting stuff delivered. You know, what can I do? I can give them the highest possible tip I can, but that's not enough. You know, these workers now for grocery chains, 
for Amazon, for uh, Instacart, and we can go down the list. These folks are now saying and st- doing job actions that say, pay us better, give us hazard pay, and give us better PPE. And in fact, in some cases, they're saying we won't work. And there's, in factories, they're stopping the production lines and saying we won't come back to work until you help us. Workers are telling capitalists, look, if you want to keep the society and economy up and running, don't let us get sick. Pay us enough to and protect us to function. So 50% of American workers, 50% of Miami area workers do low-wage frontline service work. In fact, our percentage is one of the greatest in the country. Boy, oh boy, if we could finally now digest the fact that we should pay service workers better, that we should protect them on the job, should we, we should give them a living wage. If service workers can become part of the middle class in the American dream, that would be a great thing. And I do think, boy, oh boy, if we could recognize this class divide and pay uh, uh, essential workers better, that could be a big positive. Although, you know, just let me temper that. When you think about it, it didn't happen right after the 1918 Spanish flu. It still took another two decades, right? This didn't come into the fore in America until after World War II. So I still think we can start it now, but it might take uh, a little bit more time to gain momentum until we finally realize the end of the struggle. Urban planning economics professor Richard Florida. Still to come, how the virus could influence efforts to build up urban and suburban areas. What we found in historical terms is that after great pandemics, young people flock to cities because cities pay more and they have lots of economic opportunities. We're back on the Sunshine Economy on WLRN. Today, work and life with COVID-19. I'm Tom Hudson. Thanks for listening and supporting public radio. Today, Miami-Dade and Broward counties join the rest of Florida in allowing restaurant dining rooms, retail stores, and hotels to begin restarting their businesses. Beaches in Palm Beach County are open again, but life and work are far from what they were just a few months ago. The economy is in a deep recession. The job market has collapsed, and public health officials still warn to wear facial coverings and stay six feet away from people when out in public. For how long? Well, we we just don't know. We spoke with urbanist Richard Florida. He's a professor in Toronto and a visiting fellow at FIU and a part-time South Florida resident. you got two extreme views. One is this dystopia. Empty streets, everyone with a mask, scurrying about, all the arts and cultural establishment closed down, all the main street businesses failed, you know, a city of kind of misery and anomie. On the other hand, if, if you listen to some urban as well, we're going to come out of this and everyone's going to be on a bicycle. They're going to be all the restaurants are going to have outdoor cafes. People are going to stop driving. All the streets are going to be pedestrianized. All the parking lots are going to be turned into alfresco dining. None of those things will be true. I mean, Look, I've been an urbanist for 40 years. I've never even thought about the effect of infectious disease or pandemics on the shape and structure of our city. So that's telling me that over the long run, they don't have huge effects. Our cities and suburbs will look pretty much the same. Here's one, though. Well, I think it's true that, that certain groups of people, people with families, will say, you know, I, I can't live in a condo or an apartment anymore. I want to have outdoor space. I want to have a backyard for the kids to play in. I might want to have a little pool or splash pad. I think in Miami and Miami Beach, where we've marketed ourselves as condo living and where we have a lot of public amenities, we've got to come to grips with that pretty quickly because I think I'm I'm already hearing lots of people who have families saying, I will move to a suburb of this metro, which isn't terrible, right, for them, or I'll go to Palm Beach or I'll go to Key Biscayne. Or I'll go to Sarasota. I mean, I, or I'll go to Vero Beach. I mean, I hear, these are conversations I hear every day because we have young kids. But what we found in historical terms is that after great pandemics, young people flock to cities because cities pay more and they have lots of economic opportunities. What I really worry about is that we're going to forget. And the example I always use, I was born in 1957. Now, I was my parents' first kid. I, my mom was pregnant with me in the middle of a pretty bad pandemic, not as bad as this one or the Spanish flu, but probably the next bad one. Yeah, the Asian flu. No one ever told me. Like, I, no one ever mentioned, like, Rich, you were born during a pandemic and mom was pregnant with you. 
So one of the things that really worries me is we forget about this gosh darn thing and don't do what we need to make sure we're protected from future pandemics. As it relates to the communities where we live here in South Florida, we have seen an urban infill since the Great Recession, this move back toward the center of cities, uh, some cities even creating density where there was none for these live, work, play areas. Uh, is is that sustainable in a uh, living with COVID uh, or a post-COVID world? Yes, in the long run, it's sustainable. I mean, look, cities survived when you know, one in five kids died when the average age uh, mortality in the United States was 35. Yeah, but we didn't have the conveniences of the Internet. We didn't have Zoom and video conferencing, right? We didn't have money moving through cyberspace. We had to interact face to face oftentimes for economic activity. You know, so, so I think the dem- demography of cities may revert, that cities may become places that young people go before they form families. I think what we really risk losing is families with kids. I mean, it's tough to raise a family with kids in a city, and it's tougher to raise a family with kids in greater Miami. One of the things that we've been able to achieve in greater Miami, which nowhere else has achieved, we have attracted a lot of high net worth people, techies, finance people, hedge fund types, because of our combination of being a great place to live with great restaurants, pretty good arts and culture, a really good airport, and low taxes. Now, those people aren't going to leave South Florida, but they could leave condo living, you know, and, and, and they could move from the greater Miami area to other appealing parts of South Florida where it's easier to get, and for the same price, get an even nicer single-family home. So I think that's more of our challenge. It's not that the city will die. It's that we may lose certain groups will still attract young people. The, the upside of that is maybe, you know, people have bemoaned, including me, the loss of artists and musicians and independent theater people, what I call the creative class getting chased out of cities. You know, maybe if some of these groups leave the city, maybe, you know, and th- that's become so gentrified and so rich and, you know, using these apartments as like safe deposit boxes for foreign wealth, you know, maybe our city becomes cheap enough again. You've heard this about Wynwood, you know, time and time again, the artists got chased out of Wynwood. You know, maybe if commercial buildings uh, are reconverted, if retail shops are reconverted, if the wealthy flee in some of them, we'll have a, we have a chance at a creative regeneration. So I don't think it's all good. I don't think it's all bad. And I guess it's really what, what we do now to prepare ourselves that'll that'll help us get to where we want to end up. Florida's economic trajectory historically has been tied to population growth. Americans moving here, immigrants moving here. Uh, for a a number of different reasons. And population growth has only been interrupted in Florida because of economic recession and only very, very short period of time and usually just a shallow drop. Given the unique nature of the COVID economic consequences, uh, you know, the lack of travel, the lack of mobility, how do you think that could affect population trends that have been so important to fueling South Florida's growth? So I think there's a couple of things. I think that Miami, greater Miami and its airport have enabled people, a lot of people to be super commuters out of here. And they don't necessarily work here. They work remotely from here, but their office is in New York or Boston or wherever. I think that hurts Miami. I think that some of those people may find that they need to go back to be closer to the office. So I think that could hurt us, even though we have a great airport. The other thing that will really hurt us is this kind of nationalism that we're seeing in our country that's being accelerated. Um, Restrictions on immigration uh, will hurt us because we have the largest share of our population, both low skill and high skill. We have, uh, along with Silicon Valley, the largest share of our our high skill population composed of, of immigrants. The uh, demographics in Florida, while favorable, have also been aging quickly as it uh, continued to be a place for retirement. Given the vulnerability of the elderly population in this virus, do you think that gets impacted? One, I think maybe we've got to move away from nursing homes and and, and packed in senior living. We need to rethink that. And two, if we're going to have an older population, we just need better ways to protect them. I think this has to be front and center in our mind. No, I don't think they're going to stop coming here, but I think they're going to look for better arrangements. You know, they're not going to want to go to these old age homes, retirement homes or these old age villages. I think that that older people are going to be smart and say they want to be a little bit safer. The other thing 
is I think I hear from a lot of older people is they don't want to be segregated. So many older people are feeling so isolated. We need to spend a lot more time thinking about the mental health implications of this. And as we think about keeping our elders healthier, and not only with regards to their physical health and vulnerability to the virus, making sure their mental health is taken care of as well. FIU visiting fellow and urbanist Richard Florida speaking with us from his condominium last week in Miami Beach. Still to come, the virus's threat to Miami's globalization. I think that it's going to present a, a number of challenges uh, to the emergence of Miami as a new type of global city. This is the Sunshine Economy. I'm Tom Hudson. Today we're talking about life and work with COVID-19. Thanks for listening. The virus is just a reminder of how closely connected the world is. Communications and travel have shrunk distances and economics have tied countries and regions together. South Florida has benefited from all this. The Miami Customs District is one of the few that enjoys a trading surplus in the United States. The value of exports leaving Miami International Airport, Port Miami and Port Everglades is more than the stuff that is shipped here. It's just one result of globalization and Florida's role in it, especially within the hemisphere. We spoke with Ariel Armoni. He's the vice provost for global affairs at the University of Pittsburgh now. He used to be the director of the Center for Latin American Studies at the University of Miami, and he's co-author of The Global Edge, Miami in the 21st Century. Ariel, welcome to WLRN. How do you think the virus impacts the appetite for globalization that has so benefited Miami over the course of the better part of a generation now? I think that it's going to present a a number of challenges uh, to the emergence of Miami as a new type of global city. Uh, But at the same time, I think that um, there are interesting opportunities uh, for Miami to rethink uh, a number of its aspects in in light of this crisis. What are some of those opportunities to to rethink the trajectory that Miami, the magic city, the capital of Latin America that it's been on for so many years? First, um, I think that um, there's going to be an opportunity to rethink um, many of the aspects that have to do with the hospitality with the tourism industry, rethinking uh, about efficiency, rethinking about innovation. Um, I think that um, uh, one area in which uh, Miami has interesting opportunities is that uh, it's a city that has been extremely successful in the um, regeneration of urban areas, uh, such as uh, Wynwood, for example. And so Miami has a great experience on that, thinking about how to combine art, uh, new types of businesses and public spaces uh, to completely revamp areas of the city. In that sense, um, I think that Miami can combine its globalized status with that kind of experience and really lead in new ways on how we regenerate uh, commercial uh, districts. As you mentioned, uh, Miami and South Florida has had a history of reinventing neighborhoods and reorienting them toward visitors, particularly in making places like Wynwood or Fat Village in Fort Lauderdale or Clematis Street in Palm Beach as uh, places where locals can play, but really geared certainly toward visitors and tourists as well. So how does that big industry, that hospitality, leisure, food, accommodations, how does that reorient? I think that um, one one way in, in which um, that could happen is that uh, it's in combination with uh, rethinking um, a lot of the urbanization of, of Miami. Um, I think that um, there needs to be a new type of uh, integration um, between hotels, um, uh, coffee shops, restaurants, bars, and new thinking of uh, public spaces new opportunities uh, to decompress some areas that, um, by definition, you know, will have to change. 
There is also an opportunity to think about new ways in which um, the creative industry can be integrated in um, innovative ways with the hospitality business. Um, Miami has done that at a very high level with Art Basel, for example. I think that there are opportunities to be thinking about those kinds of connections uh, at various levels. If um, they are really, you know, comprehensive targeted efforts to do that at various levels for different kinds of audiences, that could be a very interesting way in which uh, the hospitality business can reinvent itself. Let me ask you, though, about another keystone industry here in South Florida. Hospitality is important. It employs hundreds of thousands of people in generally what are low to medium wage jobs. Trade and logistics, also incredibly important here, generally higher paying wages. We've seen, of course, the effect over the last couple of years of the tariff war with China, uh, and now COVID. What could these mean for the trade industry here in Florida? This is a sector that definitely will will suffer. I don't want to be pessimistic, but... um, it's difficult to think about, you know, uh, ways in the short term or short to medium term to alter the trend that we will be seeing. The, the latest economy says that uh, world goods trade may shrink uh, by 10 to 30 percent this year. And uh, so, of course, this is going to impact um, the Port of Miami. Trade activity is going to suffer. Another area that uh, is very important in terms of the global status of Miami is um, Miami as a transportation uh, hub. Air is also going to suffer. We will see a really sharp decline in terms of passengers. We've seen a great deal of public investment in trade and transportation in Port Miami, Port Everglades, uh, Miami International Airport. Uh, Fort Lauderdale, Hollywood uh, International, uh, West Palm Beach. Um, For the short term, are those investments going to be able to uh, see a return? And what what kind of time frame do you think is going to be necessary given the difficulty of global trade and perhaps the more murky picture of what uh, business and, and, and pleasure and leisure travel look like? We will have to think about a horizon of maybe at least a couple of years before we see um, sort of a reversal of the trend and we see kind of a trade maybe getting back and approaching, you know, pre-COVID-19 levels. Um, I think that uh, it will be absolutely crucial to be able to maintain uh, and upgrade as needed, but, uh, you know, those investments, but particularly maintain that because that will be very, very important in terms of the competitiveness um, of South Florida. Those investments, those public investments are going to be hard, perhaps, to communicate and hard to stomach given how much local tax collection rests on tourism and trade and what kind of shape that's going to be in for at least uh, the near term. And on the flip side, of course, is the huge increase in local demand for public resources to deal with the public health and the economic consequence reality of COVID-19. Essentially, if we look at the economy of Miami-Dade County, well, we can talk about in the number of people in, you know, who work in the, in the tourism sector uh, the tourism sector is not one of the largest contributors to the economy. And that's because of the low wages too, right? Exactly. And so the foundational uh, elements for the economic transformation of Miami are trade, uh, real estate, and transportation, passengers, cargo, etc. So in that sense, if that you know, suffers, then that's the kind of structural component of the economy that will be very, very difficult to regain. And, and, and particularly because, as you know, there is a lot of competition. You know, everybody wants to be a hub. You have to accept that reality and continue, you know, to maintain and, and if necessary, invest in those sectors 
because it's not just, you know, what happens in Miami, but it's also what happens in terms of the competition, you know, with other parts in, in the south of the United States. Ariel Armini is the co-author of The Global Edge, Miami in the 21st Century. Now, still to come as our conversation continues, how the pandemic and politics may continue influencing immigration and Latin America's view of Miami. The really difficult challenge will be to address this big pushback against globalization. But if there is a city that should be at a leading position in terms of advocating for globalization, it's Miami. We're back on the Sunshine Economy. I'm Tom Hudson. Even before COVID-19 came to the United States, an enormous force that has helped fuel South Florida's economy for generations was slowing down, immigration. Last year, the number of people born in other countries and moving to the United States dropped to its lowest level in a decade, according to the Census Bureau. The Trump administration's immigration crackdown and slow economic growth in Latin America contributed to the decline. Over that same decade, no state gained more residents, though, from overseas than Florida. 1.1 million new Floridians. One in five Floridians were born in another country, and that rate is much higher here in South Florida. Immigration is intertwined with the economic prospects of the region. From real estate investors to labor, COVID or not, Miami's economic prospects are as tied to Latin America and the Caribbean as they are to the rest of the United States. The pandemic and politics here and in the hemisphere will continue impacting immigration and its economic influence. Ariel Armini is the Vice Provost for Global Affairs at the University of Pittsburgh. He used to teach at the University of Miami, and he's co-author of The Global Edge, Miami in the 21st Century. Miami has benefited from political, social, and economic strife in Latin America for decades. How does the virus and how the United States, Florida, and South Florida is responding to it affect how the region is viewed in the hemisphere? Uh, That perception is uh, very much um, influenced by a general perception about the way in which uh, the United States as a whole has reacted to the pandemic. That combined with substantial decline in terms of uh, positive views of the United States uh, is contributing to a sense of a country that uh, is not doing things well. But at the same time, we know that still in the minds of uh, many Latin Americans, Miami is a place that is highly desirable. It's a place that is seen as a location that provides safety, security, the possibility to be oneself, to be more relaxed, um, to have a different kind of life. No matter, you know, that general perception about the United States the sense is that Miami and the region will will continue to provide a safe haven uh, for those who feel that daily reality of their countries is just too much. What will you be looking for in the local and regional response to give you a sense of whether or not Miami and South Florida is able to maintain the global edge that you write about in your book and that you've researched? In terms of the global dimension of Miami, I think that um, one of the important things is really to think how Miami can connect more uh, broadly with different parts of the world to explore connections with different parts in, for example, in Asia, with which uh, Miami still doesn't have enough connections. um, and There could be opportunities there. For trade, there could be opportunities in the future for tourism. There could be opportunities for joint ventures, uh, for attracting talent and investment. I think that uh, Miami, uh, we call it an emerging global city in the sense that uh, it still has uh, quite a way to go in terms of becoming that kind of really global city. And and that has to do with the fact that uh, the city, I think, and the region has not yet discovered 
possibilities around the world that are really, you know, very rich and, and that offer lots of opportunities. I would look at the world map and, and identify new areas and reach out to them. There are lots of opportunities in Asia that uh, Miami is not exploring. That may take a high level of a risk tolerance and a high level of diplomacy, right, given the current environment. Uh, when it comes to uh, global trade generally, but particularly around relations between the United States and China. Yes, but uh, absolutely. But I think that uh, there you have two different, you know, topics, which, of course, you know, connect in many ways. But one is uh, sort of this uh, pushback against globalization. And then, of course, you know, the relationship with China. By really exploring uh, relations um, and trade and other kinds of ventures with other countries, Philippines, Malaysia, India, um, etc., there are you know lots of opportunities that will open up that have really you know not much to do with China. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, the really difficult challenge will be to address this big pushback against globalization. But if there is a city that should be at a leading position in terms of advocating for globalization, is Miami. Speaking with Ariel Armini, co-author of The Global Edge, Miami in the 21st Century. Now, still to come, a financial statement, a story of money and the price of life in South Florida by a couple experiencing the health threat and economic consequences of COVID-19. I treat COVID patients all the time. It affected our shop big time. He was out of work for a couple of weeks. That's still to come. We're back on the Sunshine Economy. I'm Tom Hudson. All this season, we have been bringing you financial statements, stories of money and the price of life in South Florida most weeks. Life has changed fast, dramatically, and in so many ways for so many people since COVID-19. If you or someone you know wants to share their story, email us, sunshineeconomy at wlrnnews.org. sunshineeconomy at wlrnnews.org. Today's story is from Nikki Mason and Joshua Berlingeri. They have experienced the public health dangers and economic consequences of COVID-19. She's a nurse treating coronavirus patients. He's a technician at a sign company that was initially furloughed for two weeks when business disappeared. Joshua has a 10-year-old son with his first wife. He and Nikki have a -a two-and-a-half-year-old boy. Hi, my name is Nikki Mason. We live in Miramar on the border of Pembroke Pines in Florida, and I work as a registered nurse at one of the local hospitals in Fort Lauderdale. I'm 32. I'm Josh Brown Jerry. I'm currently 34 years old, and I'm the head lead installer tech at a sign company. We have a son together, um, and we, I guess we're boyfriend and girlfriend. We'll get married at some point. (laughs) Um, I normally work with stroke patients, patients with congestive heart failure. That floor is now the COVID floor. I work three days a week um, in 13 hour shifts. I treat COVID patients all the time. Um, Yesterday I was on the COVID floor. So, um, you know, I'm direct in the front line with known positive COVID patients. It's scary. For who? (laughs) (laughs) No, it is, but I mean, she takes full precautions, you know, uh, you know, two masks, full gowns up. When she gets home, she has, uh, you know, puts her clothes right in the washing machine right to take a shower. I'm not worried though, because she knows what she's doing. Um, When I get to work, if I'm working on the COVID floor, um, you know, I immediately prepare myself. So I have um, the N95 that I wear constantly um, with the surgical mask over that just to protect the N95. Um, I also have my hair cap and then we have a face shield that we wear as well. So I have those on at all times while I'm working. Um, Then when I go into the rooms, we also have um, the gowns that we put on, as well as gloves, obviously. And many times I I use two gloves or even three gloves, especially if I'm going to be around 
um, you know, changing the patient, you know, and things like that, where, you know, bodily fluids can come into the, the factor. And um, so we just take extra precautions there. I have a change of clothes that I bring with me. Um, I leave it in my car and I, I go and get it um, after work and I bring it back in and I change my clothes, um, put my um, my work clothes into back into that bag, which I come home. I also have Lysol mixed with water. Um, I also have a little spray bottle that has, um, has rubbing alcohol with just a little bit of essential oils just to keep it smelling better. I spray down my car when I get out of it. I spray down my shoes. Um, before I even walk into the door. So I'll have Josh open the garage door for me and I, I come in that way. I leave my bag and my shoes and everything, which I spray down again. Um, and then I immediately go upstairs and take a shower. And then all of those clothes that I've been wearing go right into the wash um, separately from anything else. And, and those get clean, so. It's a lot, it's extra, <laughs> but it's important. On March 16th, um, it was a Monday, I had a patient. I had spent the whole day with him. Um, at, back at this time, they were conserving all of the PPEs. We were waiting for, you know, everything to happen. So we weren't, we were asked not to wear masks. I actually remember him coughing on my arm and thinking to myself, well, I, at least he doesn't have COVID. And then the next morning, March 17th, um, I go to check his vitals and he has a fever. His heart rate is going up. His blood pressure is coming down. Um, he's visibly having respiratory issues. This gentleman was from a facility that was known around here to um, have patients positive for COVID. Um, so the patient was moved to the floor. And back in March, this was when we would do the COVID test, but it would take you know three days or so to come back. Um, so I spent the rest of the, that Tuesday at work. Um, and then I had Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday off. And Friday afternoon, I was preparing my lunch for the weekend, and um, one of the doctors at my work calls me and informs me that that patient had come back positive, um, and for the safety of everybody else, that I had to stay quarantined for 14 days. I was at work. I was at the shop doing a huge install, uh, getting ready for the hard rock, and she called me and told me, and I, I was like, what? Like, are you serious? And she's like, no, I'm dead seriously. He came back positive for COVID and I'm at the house on quarantine. It was very emotional at first. Um, I know that that Wednesday I, I had a really hard time with it. Josh was actually still working and I was home by myself. The baby was in daycare. I had a breakdown and I just was physically ill from being so emotionally, you know, just terrified of what might happen, you know, th that this patient had it, that I may have gotten it, you know, that getting my family sick, my kids sick. Um, so it was, it was pretty rough. What if she does have it? How are we going to deal with this? You know, with the baby and with our Riley and our oldest, like how are our plans going to change? How are the living arrangements going to be like, you know, it was definitely rough at first until we found out she came back negative, which was great. I was very blessed. I got very, very lucky. It came back negative, and then I went back to work on the 15th day after after that. Finances, luckily, have not been um, an issue on, on my end. It affected our shop big time. He was out of work for a couple of weeks. Yeah. He had a rough time with it at first. You know, he's, he likes to be financially, you know, do his part of, of of this and I think that's what scared him the most was that he, he wouldn't. We had to have, sit down and have conversation about, you know, hey, I have, we have money in savings. We're, you know, we're gonna be fine. Let's, you know, let's not stress it. There's enough to stress about. Don't stress it. You know, I, I can take on the, the, the half of that, you know, that you normally take on. Well, I definitely built a lot of stuff <laughs> on my time off, that's for sure. Uh, I built uh, Jaden and our little baby. I built him like two uh, high stool chairs. Like he washes hands. Uh, I built an outdoor table. Uh, I built uh, Nikki a, new, a brand new spice rack. You know, just trying to stay busy with everything. I actually just went back this past week. Oh, it's uh, it's a lot off my shoulders. You know, it's nice because we split the finances pretty much. You know, down the middle and. Now I don't have to be as concerned about what, how much more I'm gonna have to be, you know, paying towards rent and 
it's good all around to have him back to work. We have, you know, separate accounts right now, you know, because we're separate. Um, and we'll probably keep that up even when we're married. But, you know, we, we split the bills pretty evenly. So um, instead of, you know, like this bill that you pay half, I pay half. We, we kind of, you know, he's in charge of the rent, um, the electricity and the water. Um, and I do all the grocery shopping. I pay for the, the Jaden's daycare. Um, I pay for um, cable. I pay for the internet. So we, you know, we have it kind of separated. And then, you know, I pay my phone bill. He pays his. Same with car insurance and things like that. That you know are, are separate things. So we, that's kind of how we how we. It balances have, out pretty good. Yeah. We moved into here in April 2019, um, and we were kind of hoping then that this would be our last our last time leasing. Um, we did end up signing another lease um, for another year. Josh has some credit issues that we need to work out. Um, I finally got my credit back to where it needs to be after being young and stupid. Um, so, you know, it's just little things like that of, of getting everything in order so that we can get the best, you know, the best deal when we do go to buy a house. So we're hoping that, you know, by next year at this time, you know, we'll be talking to you from a house we own. My best friend is a nurse in Michigan and, um, you know, the pay rate for the nurses are, are about the same, but the, the housing and the, the cost of living are just so much less. Um, you know, for, for what we can afford here, it's, you know, shackles compared to what we could afford, you know, a lot of other places in the, in the nation. So it's, it's kind of a bummer, but, you know, it, I guess you, you get the good points like the palm trees and the weather. So maybe that makes up for it. <laughs> I don't know. I grew up in Michigan. Josh grew up in, in Illinois. So we're, you know, Midwesterners. So this is kind of, it's interesting raising our kids here. Riley's mom is here. Uh, my parents, which are a huge help in, with the kids, are here. I don't see us moving from South Florida. My kids are going to be South Floridian, born and raised. Nikki Mason and Josh Berlingeri in Miramar. He was able to go back to work and get paid full time when his employer received a forgivable loan from the Paycheck Protection Program that was passed to help businesses keep workers on payroll. She was tested for COVID antibodies recently. The test was negative. She continues treating patients with the virus. You can listen to other South Floridians who have shared their experiences with us at WLRN.org slash financial dash statements. You can also look for a podcast of this program and all of our previous programs by searching Sunshine Economy on your podcast platform. Joe Johnson is our technical director. Katie Lepre is our engagement editor. Polly Landis is our booking producer. I'm Tom Hudson. Thanks for listening and supporting Public Radio.